OK, good morning and welcome to uh, number six TDI webinar uh, on enabling active travel. My name is Carla Jakeman. I'm the innovation lead for Connected Transport at Innovate UK. I'm the sponsor for the Transport Data Initiative. You're really welcome today. We have got lots of new faces, which is great. So the Transport Data Initiative is normally to support local authorities with their data and transport challenges, but I can see lots of new faces in the audience. So um, we're, we're really looking forward to demonstrating the kinds of things that we, which we do normally in a Transport Data Initiative back in the good old days when we could actually see people live. Um, but on that, bit of good news you can have your hair cut in 25 days people we're getting there we're so close so don't don't give up we're nearly there um now a little question for you how was your commute to work today was it a bit like mine from the kitchen to the back bedroom the biggest obstacle being a cat or the ironing pile so what how active was your commute to work this morning now, Enrique Neto, who was, um, he was a, a Portuguese um, a entrepreneur. He said, active commuting increases individual energy expenditure and is easy to incorporate in a normal daily routine. Now, some might say that's a bit of a sweeping statement. It's not that easy for a lot of us to incorporate it. You might have physical, mental barriers. You might have, especially around safety, you might have economic barriers. You might not have a bike. You might have geographical barriers. You might live in the middle of nowhere in a very hilly area. So we're going to unpack some of these challenges today and we've got some great speakers to try and look at some of those issues and what some people are doing to try and overcome some of these challenges. So um, we have Scott Kane, who is the CEO and founder of Active Things. Scott's going to be talking about his activity in active travel and also some work he's doing for Innovate UK with Professor Glenn Lyons. We have Julian O'Kelly who is Head of Innovation, Technology and Research for the British Parking Association. Now you might think that's that's a, a, an unusual link, parking and active travel, but you're going to love this one, Park Active. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing a, a bit more about that. Then we wanted to introduce the, um, the local authority aspect. So we have Laura Wells from Brighton and Hove Council, and they've been doing a lot in active travel. So it's going to be really interesting to see what one local authority is doing. And then last but by no means least, we are very excited to have the Deputy Director for Active Travel for the Department of Transport, Rupert Furness, who is going to be talking to us about what the government are doing with regards to active travel. Now, there will be a panel. All of our speakers will be on the panel afterwards and you will be able to ask your questions. Please, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, Tom and the team behind the scenes, they will be trying to field some of the questions for us so that we can answer them. We've got like 11 billion screens be in front of us trying to monitor everything. So please put them in the Q&A box. Do us a favour and um, that would be great. OK, thank you very much. Now I'm going to pass over to you, Scott. How can you help me to cycle to work without getting helmet head? You're on mute, Scott. Still on mute. There we I was go. sabotaged by Tom. Tom put me on mute there. There we go. Uh, thank you, Tom, <laughs> and, and thank you, Connor. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we'll come to the uh, we'll come to the helmet head and hair matter. Although clearly, people in glass houses pointing at my own long locks here. I don't think I think we should necessarily uh, focus on such things. So anyway, so in, in my ten minutes, I'm going to cover three areas. So as Carla said, uh, I'm a former colleague used to work at Innovate UK and have been doing work with Carla and Professor Glenn Lyons on an intriguing topic called combo travel, which we'll unpack. Um, I've also been um, formerly uh, worked as the chief business officer at the Future Cities Catapult, and I've been working with uh, my former colleagues there as an associate in helping develop their active travel program, which is very exciting. And then lastly, uh, which I guess is my uh, kind of default job, uh, I'm a founder of a, of, a, of a business called Active Things, which is an active travel and active environments business, which brings together some skills from the UK and the Netherlands. Um, so uh, each of those I'm hoping is, is relevant to the particularly the, uh, the local authority audience. So combo travel, intrigued, I hope you are. Um, so um, 
I guess it builds on some work that it's Carla's concept, which we've kind of teased out, but it also builds on some work that uh, I did about two years ago with Go Ahead Group uh, around the future of transport and um, how we could inspire more people to have an active first and last mile of their everyday journey. Um, so what is combo travel? Well, it's active travel in combination with one passive motorised form of travel. So think bus, train, even car. Now, we think it's distinct from mobility, mobility as a service because combo travel is specifically focused on encouraging and enabling active trips. So why? Uh, because active travel um, is in some ways a super policy in that it delivers against so many different policy areas. Um, and in doing so, it has so few, if any, unintended negative consequences. So there's a there's a brilliant concept that it, that it is, in fact, a super policy. Um, the top line on that is that from the analysis that Glenn, myself and Carla have been doing, we think it's a very rich area for innovation and an innovation programme for um, Innovate UK. Um, and so think things like bikes on buses, think things about like bike parking at bus stops, think about kind of interchanges, think about uh, train stations and different opportunities in and around train stations where those kind of, uh, I guess, some of the human needs that we face could be better innovated and solved. So more on that soon. Um, so connected places catapult. So um, yeah, we're setting up uh, a collaborative and I think pretty ambitious uh, programme working with Neil Fulton, who's the chief delivery officer, and Mark Westard, who's the chief technology officer, has twin aims uh, to accelerate the UK's active travel market. And then secondly, to grow the innovation capacity of UK active travel firms. So that cuts across everything from advanced manufacturing, the sort of world leading uh, design and engineering firms that we have here in the UK, the digital economy, uh, innovators in finance and insurance and so forth. So you know, really sort of think about it in its very broadest sense. And we've been convening different actors in the market from both the supply side and also the demand side. Um, I think the central concept there um, for both combo travel and also for the Connected Places Catapults Active Travel Programme is that we need to be more deliberate, intentional and coordinated in how we grow our active travel firms and market. Um, you know, perhaps something again to say time. Um, the Catapult has a four part programme, so that's active travel, work package one, advocacy, strategic partnerships, living labs and then uh, research and development and innovation. And I would hope that each of those would be particularly relevant. Um, perhaps the Living Labs specifically for the local authorities would be really keen to get in touch and pick up on that in order to deliver, as I'm sure Rupert will say, um, uh, a gear change and indeed a step change um, by bringing the supply side and the demand side innovators together. And then lastly, uh, uh, but not least, so active things. So. Um, I guess if you take it, imagine an American sort of San Francisco accent. Uh, um, and what we're trying to do here is build the platform of choice for active mobility. So what do you mean by that? It's what do you we think about whatever anybody needs to know or indeed do once they've decided to make an active trip or whenever they're thinking about making an active trip. So we've started on, you know, for example, uh, where the bike parking finder for Transport for London um, here in London. Um, but the thing that we're focused on first is essentially looking at the, well, making bike parking less uh, of a bother. So in particular, adding to the supply of secure bike parking, but on demand accessed via an app. So no keys, no single allocation where only one person can use it. Um, and so that's less about your primary place of work or your primary place of you know residence. And it's more about the sort of intermediate journeys, the kind of three quarters of trips that we make when it comes about. So, you know, to the shops, to the gym, etc. Um, and we are now beginning to roll those out with a partner um, in uh, Scotland, place in Scotland, uh, Manchester, uh, we have a particularly, I think, innovative, um, not just product, but also um, revenue share model. So how can we begin to rethink road space reallocation and how can we begin to think about new revenues that might be lost from parking but actually be generated um, in relation to active travel so um, we'd love you to get in touch about that um, scott at activethings.io there's my 10 minutes thank you very much Carla, you're on mute sorry 
Oh, we're all doing it this morning. <laughs> Something Thanks, in Tom. the air. Thanks, Tom. Um, thank you, Scott. I, th I think there's some some great things that are going to come out of um, the, the work that you've been looking at there. Um, and I love that deliberate, intentional and coordinated. So definitely something we need to do more of as, as you local authorities will, will know, as well as the our industry listeners in today. Um, Scott, one quick question before we go on to our next speaker. Um, how can um, how can our um, viewers today find out a bit more about what's going on with those activities at the Connected Places Catapult? Um, yes, yeah, so um, in the first instance, please um, get in touch with myself and I can then plug you in. Um, there will make, I think, a more visible part of the of the kind of Connected Places Catapults website open and there will be outreach from um, the kind of events and marketing team as well. But for the purpose of today, I can plug um, people into the programme and um, there'll be a series of sort of outreach events and activities and so forth, um, but also a listening exercise to try and make sure that we're focusing on the, the particular problems that local authorities most want solving. So that might be, for example, around um, monitoring and evaluation of, um, of, of something like low traffic neighbourhoods, working with Professor Rachel Alden and team. Um, so please make contact with me in the first instance and I'll, I'll make sure that we follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, Rupert, I've seen that you've got a question for Scott. I'm going to address that in the Q&A, don't worry. He won't get away with it. I, I do want an answer to that. Ah, OK, yeah, helmet hair. Okay. Oh, you are going to answer it now, OK. Uh, OK, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, this is this was one actually for Car I, mean, I suppose most most routes go back to Carla Roots, see what I did there. Um, oh, uh, uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, in a former life, well, actually, uh, until the pandemic, we also had uh, um, a service that was running called Run Friendly. And it was basically showers on demand in gyms and hotels and co-working spaces. So if you want to turn up work ready, um, but you don't have facilities at work, you can avail yourself of such facilities um, essentially via the Run Friendly and Active Things app. So um, it isn't uh, it isn't necessarily a, a, a kind of a, a solution for everybody. And sometimes you've just got to go with the wild look um, or indeed not. <laughs> there yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. OK, so um, I'm going to pass on now to Julian from the British Parking Association. As mentioned, this is this is um, something I wasn't expecting either, despite having worked with uh, with the, the British Parking Association for quite a few years now. So um, I'm really excited to hear what Julian's going to say about their uh, their activity Park Active. So Julian, over to you. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, and uh, you raised the bar there very much with that introduction. Let's hope I can deliver on that. I'm going to talk about Park Active. I'm going to try and uh, share my slides now just to uh, give it a bit of an accompaniment. Uh, we all seeing this. Uh, yeah. I hope so. yeah, great. So for those of you who are not familiar with the British Parking Association, we're Europe's largest uh, non for profit trade association representing the parking sector, which is increasingly becoming one and the same as parking and mobility sector. And um, Park Active is a scheme that we've been developing over the last year, uh, which is all about enabling our operator members to embrace all the benefits that are being offered by active travel to our health, our wealth, our society and so on. Before we get into the details, let's look at the context of why a parking association would want to get involved in active travel. Parking is part of transport, of course, and we know that transport has got a long way to go to match other sectors in terms of what they're, they're doing for uh, greenhouse emissions. You can look there at the energy sector and how that's really transformed over the last 30 years with the move to renewables. And yet transport has only decreased by 30% since 1990 in its emissions. And we're all using a Cardo and Amazon and so on. So van traffic, it says they're doubled since the 1990s, but I'd imagine we're getting on for troubles during uh, the last year. So, bit of a problem to say the least. And then added to that problem, we all saw this uh, parking chaos uh, in the uh, summer first ease of, of restrictions. I'm afraid it's quite likely we're going to see scenes similar to that uh, coming up as we have perhaps quite a car led recovery as we're reluctant to get onto public transport uh, as, as behaviours are embedded for, for the, the short to medium term at least. Now, the BPA is very keen to support our members. We've got over 290 local authority members um, to, to, to help them find different ways of enforcing more effectively. Uh, and please go to our website for more information on that. But before I digress too much into that, let's think about some of the other pressures, some of the other levers, if you like, that are changing the way that we'll be traveling. 
we know that clean air zones will expand. We can see uh, it's going to be rolled out over the next 20, 30 years. We can see it started in Bath just recently. So we're not going to be able to drive into city centres like we used to without paying a heavy fine unless we've got uh, an ultra or, or zero emission vehicle. And that's what's happening at the micro level in Oxford. It's going to expand over the next uh, 10, 20 years. A few more factoids. We know uh, that if you think about your walking environment, you've got a good chance of improving the uh, footfall, the beleaguered high street. We've done a massive piece of research, first of its kind, a, a public perception study of parking. And one of the questions was, how far are you prepared to walk from parking to your final destination? Well, five to 10 minutes isn't too bad when you think about it. That's that's the last half a mile, which is not being congested uh, and that people are walking. Conversely, we asked, how long do you spend, uh, spend looking for parking on the high street? We waste 2.3 days a year driving around, looking for a spot, idling our engines and polluting the atmosphere. And yet so many of our journeys are short, five miles, 50% of car journeys, and they're perfectly suited to cycling and walking. And if we did actually really do something about increasing our cycling and walking, there are massive savings we can make. And I think the, the most shocking statistic is the, the 8,300 premature deaths that could be prevented if we did really increase cycling and walking. And we all know about the case of the, the case of Ella in London, where it was the first legal case that had been pinned down to air pollution for a premature death. And of course, uh, the government's very much behind active travel, and I'm looking forward to hearing Rob talk about this more. A uh, few of the, the highlights, the 10 point plan, the gear change, the 2 billion funding for local authorities, and more recently, a second round of funding for um, innovations around uh, green recovery. So the BPA really wants to encourage our members to go with the times, think about all these changes in society and the way we're moving around and move away from the traditional conception of, of a parking spot and parking is just being about where you leave your car to thinking about uh, a parking space being a mobility space. It could be where you charge your car, maybe in a, in a long stay car park overnight even. Um, it can be where you've got a logistics hub and most importantly, it can be where you consider your last mile or miles um, travel as an active travel departure. And that's how Park Active came to being. We were thinking about um, how there was some underutilized, particularly long stay parking on the periphery of towns and cities. We were thinking about the oversubscribed parking in hospitals, uh, the school run and so on and what the sector as a whole could do about that. And essentially, the scheme is all about encouraging our members to really focus on those peripheral car parks as offering onward travel, active travel options, cycling and walking, e-bikes, if you consider scooters in the future as active travel scooters as well. More specifically, we've got a framework with an operational guide that you can download from the website. Um, we're growing a network of uh, stakeholders that are interested in joining forces with us. We've got branding guidelines that we've developed over the last year, the communications toolkit to ensure that in the future people will see this umbrella term park active and they'll know that car park, whether it's a private or a public car park, is a great one to consider active travel. So the uh, URLs down in the left hand corner, park-active.co.uk, you can download our various uh, resources from that website. And I mustn't gloss over what it can do for operators, for those of you who are uh, listening today who are car park operators, particularly local authorities, I'd imagine. We know from uh, our own research aggregating uh, the availability data over the last year during COVID that long stay uh, car parks are more underutilised than they were before. No surprise, perhaps. That space, as I said at the uh, beginning, can now be used for bike hire, storage for cycles, you know, if you've got the first mile destination to the car park, you can store your bike there. This is, uh, if you like, an umbrella concept where all of these things can be housed in that underutilised space. And we hope it will do something to avoid the tourist parking chaos that we uh, all witnessed last year. If you uh, consider a park active site and then um, uh, actually walk or cycle to the beach rather than clogging up all the roads and their roundabouts going up to the beach. 
it's started. Colchester have got it up and running. They've got incentivization with um, my permits, so you get a cheaper parking if you use the scheme through their, their commercial partners. They've got DFT approved signage, so we've worked with uh, DFT to make sure it's TSRGD compliant. That's what we want to see in the next year. All over the country, maybe if you've got one of your apps like Parkopedia, it will show you where there's a park active site. So we've been working with the DFT. They did generously help us develop the concept. We're hoping for some uh, further support to help us market and really scale up this idea um, and of course evaluate how it's done. And, uh, you know, we, we've already know there's lots of different metrics we can look at from parking uh, usage to congestion, pollution and so on. So we want to see what impact it has where, where it's taken up. So please do get in touch with myself or my colleague Julia Jepps, who's the programme manager. There's our contact details and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's that's um, when we've talked about transport hubs for a while and um, it's great to see that these are finally happening. So um, and it's it's um, happening in we can see we're going to have it all over the country so if you if you have some comments on that if you're whether you're industry or local authority um, and you have comments on what Julian's just said or in fact what Scott said um, or questions please do put them in the Q&A box and we'll address them later on um, also um, if, if you've got um, if you are a particular local authority and you are already working on innovations where you can put your bike on a bus for example then also please do let us know because we're looking to find out who's doing what so um, it's your opportunity to sort of say hey we're doing this so please do flag it to us and then that would be great OK, thank you. I am going to move on to Laura then. I'm talking about what local authorities are doing. Um, so part of the TDI for those of you who are newer members is to really get that conversation going and encourage the knowledge sharing between local authorities to get best practice and what works, what doesn't work and really try and get that conversation moving towards innovation and helping overcome a lot of the barriers when it comes to transport. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Laura is going to say um, on how they're tackling a lot of the challenges around active travel. Laura, I'll pass over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Carla, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, got some slides here as well. Um, so yeah, I'm Laura Wells, Principal Transport Planner. I'm in the Transport Policy Team at Brighton and Hove City Council. Um, next slide, please. I'm uh, just going to tell you a bit more today about um, some of the background and challenges we're facing in Brighton and Hove and then a few examples really of um, how we're how we're doing all things active travel um, and some sort of um, knowledge sharing best practice, hopefully. And yeah, it's great to use forums like this to um, start discussions. And I'm very happy to um, you know have any further conversations with people and, and, and keep learning on this as we as we go forward, really. Uh, next slide. So just um, a bit of background before we um, go into some of the details. So some of the challenges and context for, for Brighton and Hove. Um, we do already have um, quite good levels of um, active travel, which is brilliant. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done as well, um, and particularly, you know, disparities between um, different different sections of the community and the city, etc. So lots of Lots of work still to be done, etc. We do have um, high levels of bus use, uh, which is great. Obviously, that's brought recent challenges with um, COVID and um, reduced public transport capacity. So, um, you know, the more we can link together uh, active travel and um, public transport, the better, really. Um, visitor economy is really huge in Brighton and Hove, um, 11 million visitor trips a year. So that's a really key part and from a transport point of view it's it's a really key consideration in in all that we do really and um you know not just the walking and cycling when people are here but um the, the broader considerations in terms of how they're getting to the city and how we can support them in that as part of the the bigger picture uh, next slide please uh, just some more of the context. So we've uh, declared a climate emergency and commit, made a commitment to be net carbon neutral by 2030, which is not that far away. And lots um, there's lots to be done um, between between now and then, and lots to be done perhaps quite differently to how things um, may have been been done in in the past. Uh, we've also recently, um, the end of last year, had a citizens' climate assembly, which is um, was, has been really interesting to see. Um, 
the recommendations coming coming out of that, which included uh, dedicated safe cycle networks and a raft of other other recommendations, which um, it's really good to see from a representative group of citizens in the city, you know, looking at the challenges that we face and how we might address them, basically. Um, lots of challenges in the city as well around kind of public health and, and COVID-19, which we um, mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Just from the policy background, just a brief mention. So the main policy um, overriding uh, all, of, all of transport in the city is the local transport plan. So we're currently developing our LTP5, um, which uh, has quite quite broad um, broad coverage of um, transport, transport themes and issues. And uh, we're looking to consult on a, an initial transport vision later this year, which will set out um, hopefully quite succinctly um, what we want to address and sort of um, what, what people's views are on um, the initial initial vision and where we want to be, basically. Um, as part of the LTP work, we're also working on um, two really key, um, really large pieces of work, which are around um, a livable, livable city centre. Um, the new project name formerly known as Car Free City Centre with hopefully a bit more of a, a broad a broad reach in terms of the terminology there and more positive than, um, than negative. And that's a really key part of uh, what we're doing for that. Um, also looking at an ultra low emission zone as well. So there's there's further work on those that's being done, which is really, uh, really key in terms of the, the bigger picture type stuff that I mentioned. Um, also looking at all sorts of other things through the LTP5, um, which, which need consideration. Um, I'm also leading on the, the LC WIP, the Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan, which obviously um, looking at cycling and walking networks, network improvements in the city. And this is um, this is in development and again will be consulted on later in the year. So some of those key documents in development, which is really, really key. Next slide, please. Um, so active travel projects. Um, yeah, it's really good to come along today and sort of talk to talk to people about um, active travel. That's something very, very close to my heart. And I think um, one of the key things to say about active travel is it's not just about active travel. And I think that's come through quite clearly already today in some of the some of the discussions. You know, it's very much about linking walking and cycling as much as we can with um, other modes and I'm really thinking of it in everything we do as as very uh, very joined up. Um, I mentioned we have a lot of bus use in the city so it's really key to us to um, try as best we can to communicate the fact that um, you know walking improvements to to walking can benefit bus passengers because everyone is everyone that's a bus passenger is a pedestrian at some point in their journey everyone that drives is a pedestrian at some point in their journey and I think that message sometimes gets quite lost and you know, we're, we're by no means um, doing doing particularly well on that. You know, we're doing our best to try and tie it all up together from a communications perspective, but it can be really difficult to get that point across where people see things perhaps as a cycling scheme or a, a walking scheme. But we we need to do better um, as an industry really to, to highlight the the wider benefits and um, purpose of of what we're doing and, and really bring the public with us. Um, and, um, you know, try and get these key points across, really. Um, a lot of what we've been doing in the city is around um, long term behaviour change um, and a commitment to that. And I know this can be very difficult with um, different funding streams, etc. But uh, for example, we've we've had um, our school travel team um, in place with the same same people for over, well over 10 years now and the same people continuing to um, engage really well with schools and build up really good relationships and um, long long may that continue. So it's been really a really key part of what we're doing, not sort of stop, trying not to stop and start things as best the funding can allow. Um, another thing to mention just generally about active travel is um, we just recently had our first meeting of our new active and inclusive travel forum, which brings together all the voices in the city, of which there are many, as you can imagine, um, around um, active, active and inclusive travel um, and bringing everyone together with the council um, to discuss um, everything to do with active travel in, in quite a broader sense as well. And it's, it's really good to see as part of that we've had um, involvement from the bus companies and um, a wide range of stakeholders and disability groups as well, which has been really key. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to go uh, do, do a bit of an overview really of some of the um, active travel projects that we're doing. Um, so obviously a key one at the moment is the Active Travel Fund, which I'm um, working on. Uh, we've got five um, active travel corridor schemes as part of the Active Travel Fund. So three of these are temporary and two are permanent. Um, and we're not just focusing on the routes themselves. Uh, we are looking at complementary infrastructure as well, things like bike, bike share hubs, uh, cycle parking, and also park active. Uh, so we're working with Julian and the team to um, 
make sure um, that's a really key part of it. And that's particularly exciting in terms of um, linking up, particularly for visitors to the city and um, getting those to uh, getting people to park and park and walk, park and cycle, etc. Um, we've just finished a consultation on the active travel fund um, schemes, so we're busy collating all the responses to that. We've had 5000 responses to the consultation, which was on four of the schemes. So we've got a huge amount of work to do to collate all of that and present it to members for decisions in in June. Um, it's not just about infrastructure, it's also about behaviour change, um, which is a um, very important part of the mix um, and not to be seen as just a separate thing. So we've got um, a better point scheme, which is called Move for Change, uh, which is all about rewarding and incentivising uh, active travel, uh, active and sustainable travel. So again, sort of working closely with the bus company and others. And we're doing a lot of work with um, schools, employers and, and communities. Um, lots of things going on there. Next slide, please. Uh, just a, just a quick additional mention of the the better point scheme. So in terms of the, the data point of view, we've got some really um, interesting data coming out of this scheme. So it's only been running a couple of months and um, we're, we're seeing lots of useful things coming out, particularly from my point of view with the LC WIP um, route planning and that kind of thing. Seeing this is a map of um, all walking journeys that have been rewarded and incentivized through the better points app in Brighton and Hove. So it, get, it gives us a really interesting perspective on where those journeys are, are going to and from broadly on, the, on this heat map. And there's other ones we can show for, for cycling and, and running even. And it's really interesting, for example, seeing the difference between um, male and female um, journeys that are done uh, in different ways, for example, running running and cycling through for different, um, uh, different genders, etc. So there's some really useful data coming out of that, which is very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this is just one of the schemes that we've consulted on um, recently. Um, just an example of one of our active travel fund schemes. Um, There's quite a large stretch here of the Old Shoreham Road, which is a key east west route in the city. And um, we've put in place as the uh, solid pink line shows shows temporary temporary cycle lanes on the road on, on both sides of the road there. Um, to the to the right hand side, the map, um, the cycle lanes link with existing permanent cycle lanes, uh, both along the Old Shoreham Road itself and also down the road called the Drive, which goes down to the seafront, linking with other facilities. So linking in with the wider network there. Um, what we've proposed um, as part of this recent consultation, we've been um, gathering comments on the existing temporary cycle lane. We've also proposed a further extension to the west and various complementary measures on side roads, which are some of which are indicated here. So, um, you know, one of, one of the challenges we're, we're looking at is, you know, temporary temporary schemes like this um, uh, on quite large stretches as a temporary scheme can be um, relatively easily done. But obviously looking to the longer term, that can be a lot more difficult and costly in terms of um, major reallocation in the permanent in a permanent type scheme. So obviously there's a bit of a, a gap to be bridged there, which is obviously quite difficult. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, just to mention of a few cycling things, we've got loads of exciting cycling projects going on in the city. So we've got our wonderful bike share scheme, uh, which is doing very well and going from strength to strength. We've got 600 bikes, 70 hubs across the city. Um, and we're pleased to announce we're expanding further to the west to the neighbouring area and also expanding to include e-bikes because one of the key barriers is um, distance and topography of the city, which is very challenging in, in some areas. So that's some um, really exciting news. Uh, we've just um, in recent months launched uh, an e-cargo e bike project. So there's a picture there of um, Brighton Gin, a local company who do deliveries by e-cargo bike with help from the council. And that's obviously very exciting. We're also um, about to be doing a, a big bit of work around residential cycle parking and on street. And obviously, this is a big area which has not really been fully addressed in the city and something we really need to um, be, be doing a lot more on as part of the, the bigger the bigger picture of encouraging cycling. So obviously it's a key issue with flats and, and some certain properties, etc., where cycle storage is an issue. Next slide, please. Um, school streets is something we've um, been doing in the in in this um, this school year uh, as part of the COVID response activities. So um, obviously trialling some measures to um, have no motor vehicle access at set times around schools. We've got five schools um, participating, three of which are trialling physical measures. 
Uh, so there's been a lot of interest in that and looking to um, you know, learn from those initial schools and um, look to the future of that as well. Next slide, please. And behaviour change. So yeah, I mentioned earlier as part of the Active Travel Fund, but but more broadly, you know, behaviour change is a really important aspect of what we do. I'm pleased to note that we work really closely with colleagues in public health and some of the um, infographics there on the right hand side are, are joint, uh, jointly produced between transport and public health to um, put out to communities, including um, uh, encouraging women into cycling, encourage, encouraging families to cycle as well. And we do a lot of work with um, schools, employers and communities in the city. Um, so there's um, some infographics, um, wider infographics that we've worked on. Um, we've also kind of had a bit of a relaunch of the um, One Journey Better uh, brand, which you can see on, on these slides, um, which has not only framed the consultation that we've recently done, but we hope to use that going forward um, more broadly for active travel uh, scheme promotion as well. So um, lots to lots to talk about and it's important about how we you know how we term things and how we um, communicate things effectively to the public so we're trying to kind of bring things together as as much as possible with some of the you know some of the challenges that we that we face that's that's all from me i think um i'll take take any questions in the q a session but there's my email if anyone wants to get in touch with any further questions that's great, that's great. Laura. Thank, you. thank you very much i can see that there's quite a few questions for you already um that, that have come in and uh, please do keep adding your questions there's some brilliant questions that have come in um i know that there'll be even more i'm pretty sure when we've heard from from rupert and um, so i'm going to pass straight over to you rupert so that we have more time in the in the q a so i'll pass over to you now Thank you very much, Carla, and good morning, uh, everybody. I've just got eight slides, which I'll rattle through very quickly. And they're a bit of a whistle stop tour of what the last 12 months have kind of felt like in the Department for Transport um, uh, and a summary of some of the things that we've announced and which are coming up. So um, next slide, please. Um, I think you all know uh, 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 this, so I won't dwell on it. Uh, you know, there are lots of good reasons to promote cycling and walking, there's the health benefits, there's the uh, environmental benefits, there's also the very important economic benefits too, the evidence that I think others have touched on that, uh, you know, high streets which are nice places to walk and cycle uh, generally have a stronger kind of footfall. Um, so I won't dwell on it, let's move instead straight away to the next slide which basically says during the Covid pandemic all of these things have become even more important. Um, uh, I think it's given us an increased focus on health. I think the Prime Minister himself felt that, uh, uh, you know, he was slightly out of shape when he was uh, struck, laid low with COVID himself back in um, March, April time. Um, uh, therefore, he's had a real focus on just getting us all uh, healthier. There was also, of course, a huge need back in May to ease the pressure on public transport because of social distancing and so on and of course cycling and walking for short journeys are a great way of helping to ease that pressure. So um, Grant Shapps, Secretary of State, stood up in May, uh, announced this new two billion pound package um, uh, and in this financial year just ending, uh, 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 nearly a quarter of a billion has been made available for um, active travel fund measures in local authorities and for things like the uh, fix your bike repair scheme. I think back in May, and I'll come back to this point, there was a real emphasis on pace and urgency, um, doing things quickly, uh, uh, which with hindsight might have been an error, but park that thought for now and I'll come back to it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then in July, of course, uh, we had the gear change vision, which uh, again has been picked up uh, this morning. Uh, really key document for us, um, uh, launched by the Prime Minister himself. Uh, this bold vision that um, by 2030, we want to see half of all journeys in towns and cities cycled or walked. Um, it's got absolutely loads of uh, commitments uh, in it, uh, grouped under four uh, main themes. Um, and I think the key thing as well here is, is, is again, re repeating that commitment to the two billion pounds of dedicated uh, investment in cycling and walking, which is um, a huge increase on what we've had before. Also worth me pointing out that that is two billion pounds of dedicated investment. Um, cycling and walking is also supported by wider investment in other programmes. Um, uh, Laura mentioned a moment ago that uh, one of the best things you can do to boost walking is to support buses. Uh, and of course, the government's um, new 
bus back better uh, strategy uh, was published just a few days ago uh, and that sets out all we're doing to support buses um, next slide please um, this I think is a key thing uh, for us now um, I think in the past there have been far too many uh, poor quality uh, cycle lanes um, a bit of white paint slapped down on the road uh, you know a cycle lane which peters out when it comes to the first difficult junction um, I think henceforth we're making very clear that DFT funding will only support uh, cycle infrastructure which meets the new design guidance that we published back in July last year um, uh, we developed that guidance over a long period with a whole group of um, experts um, uh, and, and this focus on quality is going to become increasingly important uh, as we go forward. Um, it, quality cycle lanes should have segregation, uh, should be wide enough, uh, you know, shouldn't have barriers that make them inaccessible to uh, some cyclists. Uh, next slide, please. We will also have um, a new arm's length body set up um, called Active Travel England. Now, some of you with longer memories might remember that a decade or more ago, there was an organisation called Cycling England, which when it was first set up had a budget of about 10 million pounds, so uh, much, much smaller sums of money. This new body will be much bigger and stronger than Cycling England was. It will also have some key roles in scrutinising the quality of what is built using government funding. It'll have an important statutory consultee status, which is quite a tongue twister uh, within the planning system. Basically, that means that Active Travel England will crawl all over significant planning applications uh, from across uh, England to see uh, whether the cycling and walking elements have been properly thought about, which hopefully should reduce the number of you know, new housing developments that are built, where the only way to get from the housing development to the shops is to drive uh, uh, a short distance around several round roundabouts on a dual carriageway kind of thing when if only somebody had thought of building a, a decent walking route between there and the town centre it would have been so much better. Um, so we'll be making some announcements very shortly on the detail of Active Travel England, exactly what kind of body it will be and exactly what the nature of its remit is. Next slide please. Um, so I mentioned earlier that perhaps our emphasis on pace back in the spring was um, was not quite right because as you all I'm sure uh, know uh, the journey has not been entirely smooth uh, this year um, and I think frankly I've been personally quite surprised at just how much of a backlash uh, some have called it a bike lash of course there has been against some of the uh, low traffic neighbourhood and other schemes, including, I have to say, in the Secretary of State's own constituency, uh, um, which is uh, sort of well in Hatfield, um, uh, which I think was a very, very sort of um, significant fact for him. He was lobbied very hard by many of his constituents saying, uh, you know, we don't like this new cycle lane in the town centre. Um, I think we are very, you know, we were particularly worried back in the autumn when things were felt very difficult that, you know, this all of this negative backlash would set back the wider cause of active travel. Um, uh, particularly, you know, if, if every scheme became uh, bogged down in legal challenges and, uh, and strong opposition and so on, um, which is part of the reason why, as I say, there will be this increasing focus on quality, uh, you know, getting the design right getting the consultation right and all that sort of thing uh, in future. Um, I think we've all learned lessons from this, uh, certainly in the department we have, and I'm sure many local authorities have learned lessons uh, the hard way uh, when things don't go quite according to uh, plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a few thoughts on next year. I mean, we, the spending review in the autumn confirmed uh, another uh, uh, 250 million or more pounds of, of funding next year. Um, lion's share of that will go to local authorities. Um, um, uh, it will importantly be a mix of revenue and capital funding. As some of you will know, we've written to local authorities already about the revenue allocations for next year. Capital funding we'll be uh, writing to you about uh, shortly. Important point here that not every authority will get capital funding next year. Um, the focus will be on those with well-developed network plans or LSWIPs to use that acronym uh, and indeed also authorities committed to delivering those high quality 
schemes. Now, I think I've got one more slide if my memory serves. Yep. Um, uh, and I'll leave you with these thoughts. Uh, you know, it has been an extraordinary year. Um, uh, my team has never had quite the profile uh, within the department uh, that we that we have at the moment. Um, uh, the funding is unprecedented uh, and, you know, very, very strong political commitment to it. And all of that is great. Um, but uh, the journey is, uh, is is never quite as smooth as, as we would like. Um, a behaviour change does take time. It's difficult. Um, and there will be many more bumps in the road. And I'm sorry, there's some words have disappeared off my slide there. Uh, but, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic uh, and different agendas collide, uh, uh, I think we'll be uh, facing you know, even more challenges to kind of hold steady on the sort of political leadership on the importance of the active travel agenda. But I'm out of time, so I will stop there and hand back to Carla. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. There's, there's so much stuff happening now, and I think when when this first happened um, last year, and, and all of the active travel became so important, it it struck me that you know this is we live in blighty. It rains a lot. It's dark. Um, so how can we get this throughout the year as well as the the combo travel stuff that we've spoken about already? But we can see there's so much going on already, um, which is which is great news, especially you know with with some of the speakers that we've had today who've who've talked about. The different activities, small, can make a big difference, um, and, and it's covering a wide area as well. Everything from schools to commuting. So, um, we've got loads of questions. So, I'm going to go straight to the questions. If, if um, hopefully all our speakers are off mute, I think Scott, you're still on mute. I'm try just trying to have a look. Um, there were some gremlins behind the scenes with muted jeers, but I think we're sorted. Right, OK, so please do keep sending your questions in and we, if we don't answer it today, we will come back to it. Um, I'm really glad that some of you are walking your kids to school as well. My son's just started cycling back from school this week for the first time, so I'm feeling proud, mummy. Um, right, first to Craig, um, with your question about um, the uh, discovery project, I have spoken to Rupert already, we're not quite sure of the answer to that, but we will try and find out, so I'm going to come back on that one. Um, there's some, a lot of interesting questions about um, Park Active. Julian, do you want to answer any of those live, or I can see that you've responded to to some of them, but um, may, maybe the one about the wider rollout of Park Active with local authorities, what does that look like? Thank you, Carla. Yes, certainly I can answer that one for starters. Well, the scheme um, was developed while we went in and out of restrictions and we're still, as we know, being told to stay at home. So there is a uh, it's not the optimum time to be pushing something that is about moving around more. However, we've got all the irons in fires. We've got lots of uh, discussions going on with stakeholders, with local authorities. Um, and, and Laura mentioned Brighton and Hover in the consultation. Colchester is going. Um, we mustn't forget our private operators, of course, and um, we've got a lot of interest from Q Park uh, and Green Parking. They're starting to, uh, you know, look at how they can set it up ready for when we are allowed to uh, move around more. But yeah, it's a difficult time to launch something that is about moving more at this particular moment. Um, but the other thing to say is, you know, we bring together local authorities involved in parking on so many different occasions at the BPA and uh, that's our opportunity to explore further how we can you know work together with them so I do hope over the next year that we have a you know a rollout across the country with local authorities and private operators. Brilliant thank you and, and Julian has put his details in the chat so if anyone wants to get in touch please do. Um, over to you, Laura, and um, we've got a couple of questions. I'm going to address these together, if that's OK. Um, Sarah from Gloucestershire and Sam Hayes. Um, so with regards to the LC WIP routes, um, have you bid success successfully for any funding yet? Um, and um, have you addressed any more rural routes? And um, let's do those first, um, if you want to, to, to take that question, those questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, thanks for the the questions. Um, the, the, our LC whip is still still in development at the moment, so we're not we're not there with a um, a document that's been been signed off and approved yet. Um, unfortunately, we weren't part of the um, uh, funding support that was provided from from DFT, so we've had to kind of go it alone and uh, therefore a bit later than um, than some perhaps. And um, you know we're, we're we're getting there with with developing it, and we can um, clearly see um, the emerging network coming through. Um, but it's still not officially approved. But, but what, what we were able to do last summer actually was um, in the midst of all the um, COVID response work was actually 
bring forward some of the work on the LC WIP and do what we called an, an interim LC WIP, just looking at um, potential for temporary routes and how that might look, obviously at a very high level, um, just to help inform the decisions that were being made quite quickly around um, temporary COVID measures. Um, and that, that document was approved along with lots of decisions in our um, committee last June um, to, to take forward lots of um, kind of temporary temporary schemes. So, it, so it, it, uh, uh, and those temporary schemes do link with the bigger picture in terms of the emerging LCWIP network. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of having the document there and then applying for funding based on that document, we're not quite at that point yet. Um, in terms of rural routes, um, we uh, we are linking with routes um, to our neighbouring neighbouring areas, um, some of which are more more rural than us. Um, but yeah, not not quite um, you know addressed all of all of those routes yet as part of the document. Okay, thanks. And and what have you learnt from uh, from the the temporary infrastructure loans? Um, yeah, it's fair to say the last year has been quite eye opening, and um, you know lots to to learn. It's interesting to hear feedback from Rupert at the national national level as, as well. And um, yeah, lots of lots of bike clash, even in Brighton and Hove. Um, and lots, I think just the speed at which those initial um, measures were put in as part of tranche one, um, the speed didn't help in that we couldn't communicate clearly enough what we were doing and why and how it was very different to the normal, um, which I think just put us on on the on the back um, the back pedal in terms of trying to then explain ourselves later, which um, didn't didn't particularly help. And I think that that was that it continues to be really difficult to get that point across compared to sort of how we normally do consultations. Um, and obviously this time around we're doing um, in line with the DFT guidance, doing a lot more things the normal way of doing a consultation and then putting things in. Um, the I think for us it's really important. I mentioned I've mentioned a lot about buses, and it's really important to us to keep the bus network moving and um, bus, bus back better, as we've learned this week, you know, really, really building on not just active travel, but but bus bus use coming back as well. And I think um, we do re we do work really closely with the main bus company and, um, you know, one of our schemes, the Seafront cycle, Seafront temporary cycle scheme, we actually re had to remove a section of it um, only weeks after it went in initially back in the summer uh, because um, of the impact that that had on a key junction, which was then affecting most bus routes in the city, which was far from ideal. Um, we didn't want to remove it, but it was far from ideal how it was affecting those bus routes. So, um, you know, one of the key learnings is to, to work closely with partners as, as best we can. And I think there is a there is a real difficulty of that um, in balancing, you know, the, the great guidance that's come from LTN 120, 120 and the great facilities we know we need with actually the space on the ground. And for example, buses putting, being put in the mix with um, walking and cycling and we don't have enough space quite for for all of it on all routes so it's um very dif a difficult balance to be had there particularly yeah. with um you know trying to get future uptake of cycling and walking where it perhaps isn't isn't there at the moment so there's lots of difficult decisions there lots of lots of learning though so that's it's great that you've got that information though um so Rupert you knew you'd get some tough questions let's face it um so I'm going to ask this one so we know that um, European neighbours are spending a lot more on active travel than we typically do in the UK um do you think the UK government can achieve the aspirations of the gear change policy without a massive step change in funding prioritizing investment in active travel infrastructure it's a yeah it's a very good challenge um as I've mentioned in the in the chat there, I mean, I think two billion pounds is, is an awful lot of money, but I agree. I think we will need more than two billion pounds to hit um, both our statutory cycling and walking investment strategy aim of doubling cycling by 2025 and also the gear change 2030 aims. However, the important point there is that two billion pounds is not the sum total of the funding that will go into active travel. There's also a whole range of wider funds. Um, um, whether it's the levelling up fund, transforming cities fund, um, uh, future high streets fund. Uh, also, one could even, as I mentioned in the talk, look look more widely at things like the bus, you know, the buses strategy. You know, there's, there is more money going in from all of those sources. Uh, I think one key thing is that, of course, local authorities need long term funding certainty so, as well as the quantum, if you like. It's the it's the long term funding certainty. And it's a shame that last year we weren't given a multi year settlement in the spending review. I'm very hopeful that this year's spending review will provide a multi year funding settlement so that we can give local authorities that long term certainty so they can plan over a much longer time period than the kind of stop start stuff that we've uh, had um, in the past. 
if I could just very briefly pick up a couple of other points in the chat. I was trying to type away with some answers, but I'm afraid you might have heard my noisy typing. Um, 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 one very important point to make is, is around the politics and how do we sell this agenda? Um, we've done quite a lot of public opinion survey uh, work um, uh, and we've published some of that and we're about to publish some more of that, which actually shows that even though there's a very noisy and uh, a noisy um, opposition to low traffic neighbourhoods, there's actually a silent majority of people including people who live uh, in the low traffic neighbourhoods who are actually supportive of them. And I think that's a very important message that, uh, uh, you know, politicians are inevitably swayed by what uh, what they're hearing from local people. But I think it's also important to understand that, you know, there, there is also a, a silent majority who are generally uh, strongly in favour of these things. Um, and I also mentioned, I also linked to one of our very good resources, the Active Travel Portal, which has lots of myths and you know myths and myth busters and good case studies uh, uh, on everything from the economic case for cycling and walking to the uh, you know familiar things like you know cycle lanes cause congestion and all those kind of arguments that are often leveled against them so I do commend the active travel portal to, to, to those of you who've not uh, discovered the joys of it yet. Excellent. So you, the, the, I can see that you've answered quite a few of the questions in, in the, the chat as well. If we don't get to your question, we will respond back to it and um, we'll, we'll send, we'll, Tom will send something out to everybody with answers to, to all of the questions. Um, Scott, I'm just going to come to you a second. Um, I saw you nodding away when Laura talked about some of the stats that they've had about diversity in and um, how uh, men and women are, are travelling um, and you were doing a lot of nodding around running. Um, so we're not just talking about cycling and walking here. We are talking about running as well. So how can you how do you think we can bring that into the to the whole active travel debate? So, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, the reason I was nodding was um, uh, tomorrow uh, the world's first running mayors get announced in 60 cities in the UK or 60 places in the UK uh, uh, as part of a campaign by Run Sun and Runners World to make the case to Rupert and colleagues that there are actually three main forms of active travel. Um, and cycling and walking um, are wonderful gifts that keep on giving, um, but there are a significant proportion of people who run as everyday journeys. Uh, so you, we may doubt the data, but uh, uh, you know the app Strava, um, which is for highly active people, admittedly, uh, shows that London is in fact the run commute capital capital of the world. So that's just, that's just to and from place of work. Um, I think I was also nodding um, around measures that we can you know, be, be considering in the round, um, whether it's for active travel or whether it's for leisure to improve you know, people's sense of safety. Um, so whether that's lighting and whether that's how we get more people um, you know, the, the eyes on the streets, Jane Jacobs kind of approach really is, you know, the more people that are moving around and are present and not in their cars, the safer that our streets will become. So I think um, actually the, the work that is being done you know, by all of us, um, but in particular being led by, you know, by gear change to deliver funding is about also making our places and our streets safer for, for everybody. Um, so active travel is, is very much part of the answer. Back to our point about it being a super policy. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think to be honest, Tom, we should probably have a, another um, whole session on the safety aspects around active travel, because I know that is one of the biggest barriers to, to a lot of people, especially with uh, in, in light of the, the sad news this week. Um, we are coming to a close and I know that there's no way we're going to be able to answer 37 questions which we can see which is fantastic thank you for getting so involved um, and also um, it would be remiss of me not to mention that I can see some of the um, Geospatial Commission active travel projects uh, that have chipped into the conversation as well that have dialed in today so uh, for those who remember a webinar a couple ago now maybe one of the first webinars we did for the geospatial commission first one indeed yeah it was the first one yeah so um we ran a competition for them we have five active travel projects all the details are in the public domain but if you want details about those um projects or you want connecting to those projects please do get in touch with me um i'm sure my details are somewhere but you you I'm easy enough to find just there's not many Carla Jakemans around thankfully for everybody um 
So I'm with that, I'm going to say thank you very much to, to all of our speakers. Thank you to Scott, to Julian, to Laura, to Rupert, and a big thank you for uh, to Tom and the team behind the scenes, as usual, doing all the jiggery pokery and everything that needs to happen to, to get these events to you. We really hope that at some point soon we'll be able to do these in person again, because I know the networking is so important for you guys to talk to each other in person. Um, but I, I hope that we will at some point be able to get back to that stage and in the meantime um stay safe and get on your bikes people and walk about thank you very much thanks all bye cheers